12 News is your local election headquarters. Tonight, live, the 2022 Rhode Island gubernatorial debate. Live from our 12 News studios, a debate with the two leading candidates for governor of Rhode Island. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this crucial debate where these two candidates square off for the first time. I'm Tim White. And I'm Ted Nisi. Over the next hour, we will be going in depth on the big issues that are facing Rhode Islanders this election season. And each candidate will have an opportunity to give a one minute closing statement at the end of this debate. And the candidates are from left to right on your screen, Republican Ashley Kalis and Democratic incumbent Dan McKee. Ms. Kalis most recently led doctors test centers, which conducted COVID testing and vaccinations in Rhode Island. She previously worked for the governor of Illinois. Ms. Kalis has degrees from UMass Amherst, the London School of Economics and Columbia University. This is her first run for public office. Mr. McKee took over as governor of Rhode Island in March 2021. He was previously elected lieutenant governor in 2014 and reelected in 2018. Before that, Mr. McKee was the mayor of Cumberland. He has degrees from Assumption College and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. There is no strict format to this debate. We're looking for an open and honest discussion of the issues, candidates. We will allow and encourage some back and forth between the two of you, but if you're not answering the question or taking too long, Ted and I will jump in. Let's begin. In our most recent 12 News Roger Williams University poll, a majority of voters cited the cost of living as the number one issue going into this election. Just this month, ratepayers saw a painful increase to their elect electric bills, and we're just two weeks away from households almost certainly seeing an increase to their gas bills. Ms. Kalis, there are programs for low-income Rhode Islanders to seek relief, but a majority of people do not qualify for those. As governor, what else would you do to help people with energy costs this winter? Yeah, so when I'm governor, what I would do is I would immediately roll back the rate hikes and I would suspend the tax on electricity. Right now, um, people are choosing between heating and eating, and it is the obligation of the governor to get involved and uh, to immediately take action. How would you roll back the rate hikes? Well, 40 years ago, the legislature passed a law which uh, dealt with energy crises. So what it said is if there was an energy crisis that impacted the health and welfare of the people of Rhode Island, the governor could execute um, their emergency powers. So that's what I would do. I would execute my emergency powers and I would, uh, I would roll back the electricity hike and I would also su suspend the tax on electricity. It's something that uh, Dan McKee has failed to do. And my question uh, for Dan is, you know, are you, uh, are you unaware, so incompetent that you didn't know that that existed, or are you too distracted by an FBI investigation? All right, well, why don't we ask that question to Mr. McKee? What would you do yeah, for ratepayers? She's saying there's yeah, more the that you could is be the doing. the most important issue on this question. We'll get to uh, the attacks. Uh, I'm sure we'll get to that um, at, a, at a appropriate time in this. So no one has done more as an elected official in terms of intervening with dockets with the PUC. As a lieutenant governor, I, I, I intervened, saved the ratepayers uh, $38 million. Uh, today, we intervened again on this rate, on this rate uh, adjustment. And by the way, it, the rate adjustment is structured uh, by the cost of the purchase of the utility and the, and, the, um, and the energy. And basically, it's just a math formula. But what we've done already is we put in $5.3 million to help 39,000 families. Actually, um, the cost is going to be either the same as last year or equal to that. In addition to that, we are working on the LIHEAP programs uh, to make sure that uh, we posted up a website today where families can go and see what they qualify for. Hundreds of thousands of dollars and not millions of dollars have been already uh, made available and we want to make sure that uh, uh, ratepayers, homeowners have uh, access to those programs. In addition to that, in the spring, I, I, I suggested that we uh, reduce the revenue, revenue tax on the electric bill 4%, so we'll be back in the General Assembly. That they, they didn't, weren't ready to do it in May with the surplus dollars that, uh, that I helped manage. Uh, we will be back in front of the General Assembly on that. And in, in addition to that, we expect that millions of dollars are gonna be appropriated. We're right now on the CAP programs that are managed by the Community Action Pro, um, Program providers uh, that a rate out is about 250% of um, the um, you know, scale in terms of income. We're gonna increase that out to middle, middle class families 
So this winter they'll receive more uh, more relief as well. Why so not we ask the General Assembly to come back now to address the taxes and people's energy bills? Why, why wait until the spring when they're back in session? No, we'll get it done in January, uh, just like we did last year. It's, it's, it's called like November, did, isn't it? Just like in January, just like we did last year with the, with the, with the first round of the, of the APRA dollars. And we'll make sure that uh, those dollars are appropriated. Today, there's many options that uh, ratepayers can pursue. And we expect that we're going to be able to provide relief to thousands of families in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, we're on top of it, and uh, we are providing relief uh, to ratepayers uh, right now. Ms. Kalis? As governor, you have an obligation to help people that are choosing between eating and heating and to do it right now. You have the authority to do that. You have the authority to enact your emergency powers and roll back the rate hikes now and also suspend the tax on electricity. I'm assuming, I, I heard you sort of defending the utility company that promised to not raise rate or to lose jobs, and, and I just don't understand that. So you're saying that right now, even though you have power as the governor to do that, you are refusing to uh, use your ability to do that as governor. I mean, we deserve better than that. Well, you don't understand the way that rates are structured, uh, Ms. Kalis, and that's, that's one of the problems uh, that you have. You don't understand the process and how it works. I do. I've been, to, I've been aggressively intervening uh, with, the, with the, um, the PUC dockets for years. As a mayor, I did it. Saved our town of Cumberland well over $300,000 a year on water rates. I understand this area. Uh, the way they handle it is the way we're handling it right now. We have $5.3 million for relief right now. The heating assistance is available right now from thousands and thousands of fa families. The LIHEAP program is available right now. Going to save families, eligible families, $800 to $1,200 a year on that heating bill. So we're going to expand that, uh, and uh, I'm going to be you know, proposing with the General Assembly to expand that. But also the 4% uh, reduction across the board on our businesses, on our families, across the board. That's something that I did ask the General Assembly to do last year uh, when we talked about the tax relief that we actually provided. Uh, two families on that to address the costs of, of living. I eliminated the car tax, millions of dollars there, $250 child credit going out to families right now. Uh, continually to put in funds to address the cost of living, and we're going to do the same thing on, our, on the utility bills as well. With all due respect, Governor, I don't think you understand your powers uh, that were given to you by the General Assembly under uh, a bill that was passed 40 years ago, which allowed you to intervene with an emergency order and immediately stop this crisis. So I am taking it as you're not aware of your ability to do so. I'm not sure, but either way, I do understand, and I posted it on my website. You can go look on my website right now, and it'll have the citation of the law and all of the attachments that you need in order to take this action. Do you understand that you had this ability and, and simply did nothing? Do you understand that we're providing millions of dollars of relief for utility ratepayers right now? We've been aggressively uh, working on that. And right now, 39,000 families, the lowest income families in the state of Rhode Island, will pay less on their electric bill this winter than last winter. We are aggressively addressing the issue with millions of dollars of relief, and families are going to receive that. Had a press conference this morning, again, continually on top of it, to make sure that families know where to go to get access to these uh, utility relief. There's going to be millions of dollars of utility relief for the families in the with, state. With all, again, I mean, briefly, Ms. Kalis, because we do need yeah, to move on. That is, um, that is taxpayers' money, and what you could do is roll back the rate hikes for everybody in Rhode Island and suspend the tax. So you are refusing to do so, and instead of using that money for other initiatives, you are just not going to use the powers that you have as a governor to end this crisis. All right, well, we're going to move on, candidates, to the second biggest issue we found in our new poll among voters in this election, which is abortion. And, of course, that follows the Supreme Court's recent decision to strike down Roe versus Wade. Ms. Kalis, you identify as pro-life, but you've said in interviews pro-choice voters shouldn't worry about voting for you because you won't seek to change current law on abortion in Rhode Island. You did tell us, though, in a recent episode of Newsmakers, you would veto next year's state budget if Democratic lawmakers vote to allow the state Medicaid program and the state worker health insurance plan to pay for abortions. Why is that a red line for you? Well, let me be perfectly clear, because I, I need to say it again. In 2019, the right to abortion was codified in state law. I will do nothing to change that law. I believe the people spoke through their elected officials. And like a majority of Rhode Islanders, I do not support partial birth or taxpayer-funded abortions. 
but I will do nothing to change that law. But you would veto that if that comes through the assembly next year. There's a lot of energy around it. I do not support taxpayer-funded abortions. Mr. McKee, you've said your next budget will put forward a proposal to let Medicaid and the health insurance programs start funding abortions. As you know, some members of your own Democratic Party in the Assembly are opposed to that. What do you say to those critics within your own party of that proposal? Well, if their insurance covers a, you know, their family members are covered by insurance, then uh, state workers should be as well, uh, and so should be people on Medicaid. Uh, we're going to support uh, the, um, the, that measure, and we have already put it into a, the preliminary uh, of the budget. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, uh, you know Ms. Kalis understands when she vetoes the budget, she actually shuts down all of state government and all the programs that help assist the families that need need assistance. Uh, that's what's happened in the in, in the state of Rhode Island. If she understood budget, but look, this is very reminiscent, right, of Brett Kavanaugh's testimony, uh, Amy Coleman Barrett's testimony, when they assured us, right, they assured us that they were not going to touch Road versus Wade. They did touch world versus weight. And now we're also on the heels of that. This is, this is uh, you know, people that, uh, that uh, Ms. Kalis supports. Uh, and also now what's, at, what's in jeopardy? Uh, marriage equality, what's next? Voting rights, those are all on the table right now. Federally, if there's a change in Congress, uh, it is very likely, because right now any, any whisper uh, given by the Republicans uh, about taking away rights we have to take seriously after what the Supreme Court did uh, this summer, right? So, what's next? They're talking about a national piece of legislation that would override state legislation, constantly, you know, in terms of law, to stop any level, any level of women's rights to choose. This is really serious, and for for Ms. Kalis to slough this off as being, oh, I'm with you, but she's completely against you. I am pro-choice, she is no choice, she doesn't have confidence in the women that live in this state of Rhode Island to actually make up their, to determine how they want to uh, deal with their lives and their bodies, and she is not um, supportive of that. And clearly by saying that the EACA is going I, to be- I am sorry. Uh, is That's going to be uh, a, a reason uh, to veto a, an entire budget, uh, it just shows you that you know we're more in the line of, of Brett Kavanaugh and uh, and Amy uh, Conan Barrett as well. Certainly, I'll let you respond, Ms. Kalis. Yeah, I mean that was those were a lot of words, um, and what I will say is that I am personally pro-life because I had three children in a difficult pregnancy, and I was preeclamptic with all of those, and I struggled with IVF. The idea that I can't have a personal opinion as a woman and do my job as governor, which is to uphold the law of the state, is quite frankly um, not okay. I can be a woman and have a personal opinion and still do my job. Quite frankly, that smacks of sexism. And so when you, when you talk in that manner and say things like, I clearly don't understand how the budget works, that's actually not true. It doesn't stop the budget. It keeps on going. You might not understand how the budget works. And I also, we don't have a line item veto. Hold on, I can talk about appropriations now that works. But the reality is you put a lot of words in there and you are trying to create fear. And we just deserve better than that. I've been very clear on my position and why I am personally pro-life, and at the same time, I will do my job and uphold the law. I understand a man like him may not understand what that's like, especially somebody who's on, uh, under FBI investigation. He may not have a, he doesn't have a respect for the law. Can you just clarify, Ms. Case, what, what did you say about the effect of a veto? I, I, no, I was saying that in terms of the budget, that it wouldn't stop everything, and the reality is we, we I am advocating, I am advocating for things like a better government, like a line item veto, different items that we can do, and I know I don't have that yet, but I'd like to. The thing that I would like to go back to is how he is using fear and um, nationalization of something to, to make no. people afraid when I have been very honest and very clear from the beginning and he's conflating a personal feeling as a woman with my ability to professionally do my job, which is to uphold the law. And I do think it's relevant that he doesn't respect the law because of course he doesn't get it. A person who is under FBI investigation for giving out money uh, for, you know, to you his- know, we're getting- we'll stop you right there for a second. Tim, I appreciated last time when Matt Brown sat here and said that I was under an investigation. You corrected, you corrected the individual that was running. Uh, do I do again. want to remind you, you didn't answer my initial question no, in no. that debate. No, no, no. The question is, am I under FBI investigation? You corrected Matt Brown that I'm not under FBI investigation. Well. So if she keeps on talking that way, then this, this, uh, this event's going to turn into a little bit more than uh, you know, uh, just uh, you know, 
talking about issues, which we are here to talk about, right? So as far as the question, look, the people, especially the women in the state of Rhode Island, don't trust a Republican who supports uh, the, um, the Supreme Court and their decision uh, to, to eliminate Roe versus Wade and then, a, and then a congressional Congress that is now more than hinting uh, that they are going to put forward legislation to take away a woman's right nationally. This is um, real. If it wasn't real, we wouldn't be dealing with Roe versus Wade. I wouldn't have had to put an executive order to protect women who would travel to the state of Rhode Island and providers in the state of Rhode Island which that I would supported, provide that. Which I said I supported. My husband's a physician, and I support protecting physicians. I supported that. So let's be completely honest. And I would love to go back to, well, let's, what, what would you like to call it other than an investigation? What would make you feel Well, better? you know what? Uh, that is off the track from the original question from what uh, Ted had asked. And I want to move on to the, the next topic. Mr. McKee, we're going to stick with you here. You have proposed raises for your cabinet. Uh, for instance, the head of the Department of Business Regulation salary would go from 135000 a year to more than 160000 Your director of administration would get a $20,000 raise to $175,000 a year. These employees already make far more than most Rhode Islanders. At a time when people are struggling, how do you defend these generous taxpayer-funded raises? Well, first of all, uh, they do important work. And we need to be competitive with uh, the um, other states that recruit people uh, to do their jobs. Uh, some of these individuals went five to seven years without a pay increase, yet there were pay increases in their own uh, departments. Uh, some of the second in charges uh, earn more money than the person who is actually directing. Kicking their hand down the road on these issues uh, for 13 individuals that help the state of Rhode Island day to day is respecting the, uh, the positions and it's helping the people in the state of Rhode Island to retain and to recruit good qualified people. Well, Ms. Kalis, you worked in the private sector, uh, so you know very well how difficult it is to retain talent. It's yes. an easy political hit for you to criticize your opponent on this issue, but is it really fair that, you know, for instance, Colonel Darnell Weaver takes a pay cut when he accepted the responsibility of running the state police because of how cabinet secretary salaries are set? I will say that when um, you go into government, it's often uh, something that you do for public service. So sometimes you do take a pay cut when you move from the private sector to the public sector. It's service. And I take issue with his claim that he can't find people because it's not competitive. I've had those conversations privately. And that amount of money is not the reason that somebody would or would not choose the job. So it's just not really honest. And it doesn't track with reality. So I think it is very insensitive to provide uh, raises of up to $60,000 for six-figure jobs in the same week that electricity prices went up. It is just missing the point. Also, that money should be used to, uh, to pay workers. The, the ripped up bus drivers deserve a raise. I mean, let's take that money and, and put it there so that we can have buses that are functioning to get kids to school. We had another bus interruption this morning where children were not able to get to school again. That is because we have not dealt with the issue of the fact that the bus drivers are not paid fairly and we, don't, we have a staffing issue. I mean, the priorities are just wrong. And who he wants to help and who he doesn't is completely backwards. I am sure that he will defend uh, you know, salary increases to insiders. But to the workers, oh, that's too hard to figure out. Mr. McKee, 30 seconds. Well, we, you know, uh, for the workers, we did settle uh, contracts. And we appropriated, paid, paid the individuals, and respected those. And we're going to pay respect as well to the people who are running important positions uh, in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, and to make sure that we, we are competitive with our bordering states. Uh, we did a full analysis of it. <clears throat> we have a plan where we'll inch up to that levels. Uh, and we started. And uh, the General Assembly gave us a window to address this by the end of September uh, through legislation that they amended in the spring. And we took advantage of that. We weren't going to kick the can down the road for another year and make people who are entitled uh, and earning a certain level of income, uh, you know, t you take that away. Ms. Kales, I'll give you a final word on this. I, I'd like to say that I went to the DOA <coughs> hearing and 
the governor shows a pattern of sort of backing away and incompetence. We actually noted that he was giving a full pay increase, and what he said in that meeting is that he didn't understand that it was all at once, because what he was saying in the press is that you know the pay increase will be over time, and then when he realized what he had actually done, he said, oh, I didn't realize that I'm asking for a modification. Now he's standing with it. I am saying that the priorities need to be correct, and I am not having issues recruiting based on that differential. It is also in a time where families are suffering and it is so hard to make it, it just shows that he's completely out of touch. Okay. Um, I want to ask each of you about some of the specific criticisms you've faced in this campaign, and I will start with the FBI investigation, and to be clear, there is no reporting that Mr. McKee himself is under FBI investigation, but there is an FBI investigation we've learned into a state contract that his administration awarded. That was into the ILO Group, a consulting firm that was founded the week the governor took office by someone working for one of your close political allies at the time. After that investigation became public, you told reporters, quote, when the dust settles and you come up empty, who's going to have the courage to write that story? So are you saying you have no regrets at all about any of the process that led to the ILO contract or the contract itself, so long as there are no criminal charges? Well, first of all, I, I don't have regrets on making sure that we're, we got kids back to school safely. Uh, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of this issue, it doesn't come up anywhere on my campaign trail. The people in the state of Rhode Island are not covering, uh, not interested in the story. They know that as governor, that I came into an difficult a personal, you know, an unmanageable situation, right? A health emergency where we were lowest vaccinated in the country. A education situation where we were not fully back in school and we knew that we were going to have three to five years of learning recovery. Uh, an economy where the businesses weren't open and an equity issue that we paid a lot of attention to. So I did go out to experts, people who I could trust uh, to give me the best information I could and the results speak for themselves. So as far as um, I can tell you, as I answered the question three weeks ago, that no one has contacted me uh, to, about this issue that is reviewing the situation. And, um, and I also answered the question, look, if you want more information, uh, go, to the, the, go to the people who are conducting the review. They're the ones who are in position to give you the answers that you want. And right now, I am not concerned. I have not been concerned for quite some time, and I do not hear that on the trail. All I do is see it in negative, disparaging ads that my po opponent is putting on, the, on right now, uh, trying to convince people th of things that are just not true. Well, Ms. Kalis, and that is what Mr. McKee has consistently said. He came into a very difficult sure. situation coming in midterm. We know where the vaccinations were at the time, and he was looking for expert advice, and you know, this was, this was and, what and happened. What do, you, yeah. what do you say to that I mean, defense and, of it? And he sent an email saying how many millions, his inner circle, and he uh, awarded a contract for $5 million over a group that bid for $1 million and uh, had 20 years of experience. I mean, common sense that does, says that, that it's just not common sense. And if he's so convinced that um, he's innocent, then I would ask that you release the subpoena into your administration. If you have nothing to hide, then just release it. And, you know, I would like to add that he says he knows nothing about uh, the investigation. The subject of an investigation is often last to know. The subject doesn't receive the subpoena, they're indicted. And so if you, off, off sometimes, so if you are so sure, then release the subpoenas from your administration. You've said that you won't do that. If you, if you feel so confident, well, please just do it for the, to the people. Let's go back to the millions of dollars that you, uh, you know, has been made a lot of, it's in your ad. Anybody who knows me, that was saying, I'm not paying that much money. That's exactly what I said. And the individual, Mike McGee, who you've taken over the coals, is someone, a, 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 uh, one of the experts uh, that, uh, that I relied on uh, to get schools open safely. Went out and vaccinated every teacher and every school worker in the state of Rhode Island. That was controversial. I did it immediately. I knew how important it was to open up schools. All procurement process were followed that were in place at that given time. So we know we followed the procedures. We know that we've got expert advice from Dr. Ja, uh, to people in the, that helped us with the vaccinations, from people who helped me staff my administration. Uh, I certainly won't mention their names for fear that they, you know, my opponent might go after them for insider deals. The, the question here is very simple. I did everything, every, every decision that I made as governor under extreme circumstances that people might not forget, might not remember. 
uh, to make sure in the best interest of the people in the state of Rhode Just real quick, if I could jump in, you said, I'm not going to pay that. That contract was valued at $5.2 million, to be clear, correct? That was up to $5.2 million. Right. And the email that we're talking about was substantially more. And then what we did, we went to a procurement process. And we went through a process where we had an up to level, which was never reported initially. Certainly, that's not, no, certainly, that is not certainly, Mr. McKee. Certainly, Mr. McKee, Mr. McKee, every one of our reports has said that. that. But we will not right let now. you get away oh, with that. In every single one of our reports, we have said up to $5.2 million, every single one. Well, I didn't, I'm not accusing you. I can tell you. I, <laughs> I said you. Well, I, I, so no. you sent it to competitive so bidding. Why were you involved? You're not supposed to be involved. I am not in involved. That's that like, is the look. You said you're not paying we're that. We're spending Why would an you awful lot of time on issues that really the people are not the even interested in. The integrity of the governor is an Briefly, important Mr. issue. Because I do want to ask so, about no, it. Yeah, you can move to me. You just said we should move on, Mr. I mean, I'm ready to move on. I've been ready to move on on this for quite some time. Because you're taking people who volunteered their time. Briefly. The people who volunteered their time, there was no transition budget when I came in, volunteered their time in one of the most difficult circumstances the state has ever seen. And they volunteered their time and I took their advice and, I, and, and the results show best vaccinated, All right. fastest improving economy. No, hold on. No, fastest improving economy. Before, Mr. McKee. We opened our schools safely. Wait, just because and you can break the rules doesn't mean that you should. Have, the test of a leader is their ability no to. Rule, no rules were broken. You do not, I mean, you just said I'm not paying that. You said it to competitive bidding and you were involved. Uh, Ms. Kalos, just, we, we've let litigated let this on. enough, Ted. Right, you, you should release the subpoena. Ms. Before people vote, you should release the subpoena. They have a, they have a right to know. All right, we, we, we are moving on. Ms. Kalos. Republicans in Rhode Island have been highly critical of Democratic candidate Seth Magaziner for running in the second congressional district, even though he lived outside that district until recently. In your case, you only registered to vote in Rhode Island this year, but you're the Republican nominee for governor. So if Republicans think it's a problem for Magaziner to run in a place he hasn't lived very long, why isn't it a problem for you as someone who moved here last year? Yeah, I've been, um, I've been honest since the beginning. And um, I have said, you know, I, I was not born and raised here. Um, you don't always get to be that lucky. But this is where I've chosen to live. This is where my family is. This is where my business is. And what I can say is that I was raised 30 miles across the border in Massachusetts, where they have a world-class education system, where they have a booming economy, where it is the best, was just ranked the best place uh, to live in the country. There's no reason that Rhode Island can't have that. And I can also tell you that I was engaged in Rhode Island in 2008. My husband trained at Brown. He worked at Hasbro, Rhode Island Hospital. We started our nonprofit comedy class, which helps children in Peru with cleft lips and palates in 2004. And like a lot of Rhode Islanders, we had to leave because we could not afford to be here. And in that time period, after I left, I took a two-person medical practice and turned it into a multi-million dollar business. I also uh, received degrees from London School of Economics and Columbia University in economic policy and security policy. I really want to do this job and I'm qualified. I like the work. And then when the country needed me the most, I stopped everything and tried to help in the COVID response because as a healthcare provider, I could. We always wanted to come back to Rhode Island. I came back to Rhode Island in service. I love this state and we need change. And this state can be the greatest state in the nation. We just need different leadership. Mr. McKee, your campaign's been very critical of Ms. Kalis for running when she moved here so recently. You hear her answer. Well, there. first of all, to get, come back to a place, you actually have to be from that place and she never lived here. But let's talk about what do we know about Ashley Kalis? Not much. Let me give you a little rundown on the next 30 seconds. She flew in here about a year ago, uh, maybe from Illinois where she, she has a house or, or from Florida where she votes. Uh, she came in here for a contract that put hundreds of thousands of dollars in her pocket. The contract was not renewed. And then all of a sudden she registers to vote and she declares that she's gonna run for governor. Sounds like retaliation to me. And in the process of, in the process of having her removed for mismanagement, she refused to leave the Wesley uh, uh, police station. Yeah. She ended up having her staff taking equipment from the person that's coming in to actually do the work. We took that work very seriously. That's why we're the number one vaccinated state in the country. So this is a, a move that she doesn't live here. Uh, she decided to run for governor after uh, she was not, that her contract was not renewed and she registered to vote at the same period of time. And then now she's taken her, what she registered as a second home in Newport. 
Now I believe that it might be her first home, uh, but not for long. Ms. Kalis, I'm owed your own some time. I'll let you yeah, respond. Yeah, I'm having a hard time following him because what he's saying isn't true. If you were paying attention, you actually renewed my vaccine contract three times. And in December, begged us, which I was happy to do, to continue the contract once again. I only found out about complaints, which quite, quite frankly are insulting to the healthcare workers that I employed, over 400 in Rhode Island, in the newspaper after I was running for governor. I am new in politics, and I thought the fact that, that together we helped make Rhode Island, um, among with countless other individuals, the most vaccinated state in the country, that is something that we could have joint uh, uh, you know, uh, agreement on. But you've turned it something that should have been a success into a political hit. And that is the character that we're, that we're talking about. Some of the things they said are just false. And the reality is it is insulting to the workers, Rhode Islanders, who risk their lives in testing and vaccine to help this state. But you did, Mr. McKee is not wrong that there was a police report. It ended very messily with the situation at the Westerly testing site. I mean, is that, you know, was that a professional way to end the contract if the two sides were splitting I mean, apart? I had health care providers. I, I wasn't there. Health care providers uh, came in. They came in to collect their equipment the day that they were told. The other testing vendor came in early. There was confusion, but there was nothing that was adversarial other than everybody being confused. I mean, that's the level of sort of disorganization from his administration. And, <laughs> and the reality is that I follow the rules in the law. I can't speak to certain things uh, because we're in, in mediation, but what happened is simply not true. But, and the, so but the, the timeline, the timeline I put it, she flew in for a major multi-million dollar contract. She lost the contract. She registered the vote and she declared for governor. It's retaliation. She could not take the fact that she was told that she was not doing a good job and that we needed to remove her from the service. That is not true. And he knows, and he, this is the issue with a governor who just doesn't, he's not tethered to the truth. He, you do know you renewed the contract three times, correct? Uh, you, you know that, right? All I know is that I'll make when sure it came he gets time the documentation. to renew, the, the timeline is correct. She flew in for a multi-million dollar contract, right? She lost the contract. She registered a vote for the first time in the state of Rhode Island. The first vote person she voted for was herself. And then uh, she declared that she was running for governor. It is, oh, it, I will provide you with the documentation because once again, you're showing a level of incompetence and untetheredness to the facts. Oh. That is not true. And I will say that it is insulting to the healthcare providers in this state that risked their lives, gave up time with their family in order to help with two surges. We okay, provided we're, over 30,000 vaccines and 400,000 tests. Thank you, Ms. Kalis. We're more than, well more than halfway through this debate, believe it or not. So we're gonna do a rapid fire section uh, to get through some topics quickly. I'm looking for a one or two word answer to each of these questions. Mr. McKee, to you first. Do you support or oppose a state ban on assault style rifles like the AR-15? I support. Ms. Kalis? I do not believe we need more legislation. In November, Ms. Kalis, voters in some communities will be deciding if they will allow marijuana shops in their community. How will you vote in Newport? Will you vote to allow marijuana shops or against them? I support it. Okay, and Mr. McKee, we asked you that question in the primary debate, and you said your answer, I assume, has not changed, that you would vote for them. Yes. Okay. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion on how we structure our elections in Rhode Island. So two brief rapid fire questions on that topic. Ms. Kalis, early voting. Is the period in which people can vote early, uh, vote early too long, about right, or too short? That's a good question. Um, we only write good questions. I Ms. know, Kalis. right? <laughs> um, it depends, right? We have to have debates so people can choose. We have to have information. I think if we shortened it, it would be more cost effective, and then we would still be able to accommodate different work schedules, which would be uh, reasonable. Okay, so you think it's just a little bit too long, Mr. McKee, too long, about right, or too short? Early I think voting. it's about right. We're, we're just getting into opening up voting in a strategy that we haven't used before. It's been very effective. Okay, and uh, Mr. McKee, Secretary of State candidate Greg Amore, um, has proposed moving Rhode Island's prime primary three months earlier to June. Do you support or oppose that plan? I think it makes sense. Okay, Ms. Kalis. I Kalis. support it. All right, and we've been getting a, a lot of really positive response from viewers on this, so we're gonna do a quick pop quiz on information the governor should know. Okay. Just two questions, uh, since there are two candidates. Ms. Kalis, what is the total size of the current fiscal year budget? All in, that's including federal restricted receipts, everything, total budget. 13.6. Is she right? 13.6 what? <laughs> billion, oh, billion, yeah. 
Yes, that's right. Okay, Mr. McKee, that is right, $13.6 billion. Mr. McKee, what is the current minimum wage in Rhode Island? Um, moving to 15, I think it's about 12 and a quarter, 12.50. I know it's 12.75, but I know it's moving to uh, 15 as well, which Okay, is good. Uh, Mr. McKee is right, it is okay. 12.25. Um, bonus question here, if either of you know this, raise your hands. <laughs> you said it's moving to $15 an hour. Do either of you know what year it hits $15 an hour? You signed it, so. <laughs> he did sign it, that's correct. It was five years. Yeah. Five years. It was after over the five season. years. 2021 was when it was signed. So 2025, it hits uh, yes, $15 correct. an hour. Ted. Candidates, you both talked about the fact that Rhode Island is in the midst of a serious housing crisis, um, affecting people who want to buy a home as well as people who are seeing their rents soar. Um, experts say one of the biggest hurdles, and some say the biggest hurdle to building more housing in Rhode Island, is that the state has very strict local zoning rules that limit construction. Uh, Mr. McKee, you just put $250 million of the state's federal funds into affordable housing, but you're also a staunch believer in uh, municipal uh, control of government. How do you balance your support for local level leaders with the fact that many municipalities are very resistant to building more housing? So we are meeting with the municipal leaders of all 39 cities and towns right now on actually putting together a written plan for housing in the state of Rhode Island, which, which, which we have not had. Uh, got the funding for it in July and we're ready to kind of put out a draft very later this year. Uh, I think that our municipal leaders understand that they're going to play a role in housing. Uh, and there's many ways we can do that. We, I, I, my mom lives in a, in a unit that we were able to put, sign, I signed legislation allowing lower apartments in Cumberland. So there's many factors that, that where communities are going to step up. I have full confidence that the, uh, the municipal leaders are going to understand that they're going to play a role uh, to make sure that we move towards a space where we use that $250 million. I believe we can get about a billion dollars worth of housing uh, from that $250 million and that we're going to need the support of the local community, communities to make that happen. Your counterpart in California, uh, Gavin Newsom, just signed legislation authorizing denser housing construction in some places, even overriding local zoning. Would you ever consider that as governor? Is that off the table for I you? I think the first option is work with the municipal leaders to make it happen. I have confidence that it will happen. All right, Ms. Kayla, same question to you. Would you support overriding local zoning in some places to get more housing, or do you think that's too aggressive a step for the state? You know, that's actually been tried before. It was tried in Massachusetts, and empirically, when you look at the data over a time period, that, that overrideability did not produce additional housing. So while it makes people feel like we're able to take action, and we are in a housing crisis, it's just not something that's been shown to work. <coughs> so what I would do is, um, when I'm governor, I'd immediately sit with each city and town and figure out why they're missing their target in terms of affordable housing. And then we will work with the $250 million to solve those problems. What we need to do is we need to incentivize, um, we need housing very quickly. And even if we were to get it approved, uh, a larger development, it would take years. So to deal with the housing crisis, we need to incentivize accessory dwelling units and conversion from single to multifamily homes. But you need to do that with the community. Having community buy-in is so important and having the funding is such a blessing because you can actually meet community needs. It's all about working with the cities and towns to get it done. In the long term, we need to make it so that development is easier. We also need to do uh, some simple things that make us more competitive. So making sure that we have a match of state funds with federal money for affordable housing is something that we should do. Because when you're looking at developers, they're looking next door and it's a much more affordable uh, or profitable to build there. So we just need to make ourselves more competitive. And um, you know, really show leadership. We didn't get here overnight. And so what I've done is I've committed to building 10,000 units a year. That's the thing about leadership is often uh, politicians or career politicians, they don't like to stick with numbers. You can hold me accountable to that number and my success or failure will be based on whether I'm able to produce units with cities and towns. Mr. McKee briefly just, she says 10,000 units a year. Do you have an annual goal for new units? Well, first of all, we got to establish how many units we need and what what price range we need them, that's, that's going on. But 10,000 units uh, in a year, um, that, that's impossible to do. Well, it's aggressive, but it's not <laughs> impossible if you listen to my plan and also are taking the crisis seriously. It's a crisis, so it, you need bold action, you need leadership, and you need a governor who's willing to get involved, just not just pay people to write plans. I mean, there's a time for plans and there's a time for action. And at this point, with rents raising, with people unable to buy homes, it's time for action. What you see with him is the lack of commitment. You can't, com I mean, we are already short uh, 30,000 units. 
Well, so I, that's I mean, a number it's, it's that is has not been proven out, but it's just another example. Just thirty of, seconds. Of Mr. the McKee lack of respond. governance experience that uh, Ms. Kalis has, uh, in terms of what we've done, two hundred fifty million dollars, eighty million dollars for eight hundred twenty-five units. That was announced in the spring. We've announced more housing in the last year than any at any one twelve-month time frame in the history of the state of Rhode Island. We're going to continue to do it. We're going to engage the municipal leaders to make it happen. And we're going to hit from homelessness all the way to fair market value, and we'll have a plan. But 10,000 units, uh, you know, that is just unrealistic. Mr. McKean. And 30,000 number, that's the first time I heard a number that high. 15 seconds, Ms. Kalis, go ahead. I mean, we need a leader. We need somebody that isn't going to just make announcements, but actually take action. With me, you will get a governor who's involved that holds themselves accountable. I'm not just going to give up. I mean, you didn't even name a number of units. You don't have to pick 10,000, but you should pick a goal. Okay, we're going to move on. Mr. McKee, this first question to you. Uh, I want to shift the gears to education. The Rhode Island Department of Education announced it would release the results of RICAS, a statewide standardized test in November after the election instead of October. As you know, Mr. McKee, education is a key issue for many voters. Do they have a right to know these results before heading to the polls? They have the right to know the results once they're ready. I think MCAS, I think the people who are doing the study have said that MCAS is in first place, that's Massachusetts, and then Rhode Island will follow. And Massachusetts released MCAS. And, and so, they, last time I checked, they had more students in Rhode Island. And my understanding is now that we're second in line to get that information. So when the information is ready, uh, it'll be provided. Now, no one has done more in education sitting in my seat than I have, right? I started public schools. I got thousands of kids in those schools right now. Nobody understands the, 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 um, you know, the uh, learning gap better than, than I do. So we're going to make sure that we do everything we can and, and do it right from day one. Like I said, who got the teachers vaccinated? That was not a policy that was in place when I came in. We vaccinated every teacher and every school employee when I came into office. So we're going to make sure that education is a priority. Uh, I have the experience to make that happen, and I'm going to use that experience to make that happen. My opponent has no experience in, um, in public education. In fact, she sends her kids to private schools. She shows up a year ago, enrolls the kids in private schools. How is that supporting public education? I'll let you respond to that in a minute, yeah. but real quick, I'm just curious, have you been given an indication at all what the numbers show as well, governor? I, I, again, I know what the numbers are going to show without seeing them. We're at a floor right now. We've been in a pandemic for the last two school years. Our scores are at an all-time low, but it gives us a great opportunity to build off that floor. I don't, last year was another pandemic year. We can fully expect this a three to five year recovery in terms of a learning recovery. We're right at it. We understand that this year, finally, we're going to open up in a non-COVID environment, and we're going to make tremendous um, uh, improvements off that floor that has been set by the COVID. He says you're disconnected. You have so kids in private school. Let me address the RICAS issue. So what I'm hearing is he knows the scores, but he doesn't think that parents and I teachers know should know what the scores are. Well, you're holding the RICAS scores hostage for an election. And I'm hearing from teachers that say they need the scores in order to uh, plan for their students' education, to work on an IEP. Yeah. Parents deserve to know. They also deserve to know and to judge uh, what you've said you've done for education by the scores before the election. Those scores were supposed to come out in October. The only other time that the scores were held was in 2018 when Gina Raimondo was running for governor, and that was the first year, so I'll give her a bye. But there is no reason that these scores cannot be ready now. First of all, I never said uh, they didn't answer the question why she sends her kids to public schools. I'll I, answer. I went to public schools. My wife teaches in public schools. I sent our kids to, to public schools. I believe in public schools. But I did not say I know the scores. I said I do understand what the scores are going to look like because of the circumstances of the last two years of working virtually, out of classroom, low attendance, teachers trying to struggle to deliver education plans on, online. Uh, we know the situation. The the, the uh, not only education loss, but also the the um, the issues that have to do with mental health issues. We're dealing with those, so it it really doesn't take a rocket science to understand that the scores are going to be low, and then we're going to work off of that base. We're now that we're into a full year. Never said I knew the scores. I don't know the scores. I'm I'm actually believing Ride that they're going to get that information to us when they got it. And at the point at this point in time, the information is not ready. Ms. Kalis. I mean, what I what I understand is that they're building a website. You can release the the scores without doing that. I mean, will you release the scores, or do you even? What is the reason? I mean, you're the I'm not governor. Sure, I'm not sure she's understanding what I'm saying. I do not have the scores, but I do understand public education in the state 
far better than you do, and I understand where the scores are going to be because of the last two years. Tell us why you're sending kids to private uh, schools. What I understand is that you are trapping children in failing schools. You know, the, uh, the right to a quality of education should be a constitutional right. And the reality is, I'll listen to the text, I'm a public school kid. I, um, I came from nothing. And the first thing that my mother did when she had any sort of money was to move us to a place with an excellent public school system because she knew that through education you could access opportunity. And um, I, I was, and I broke my mother's heart a million times. I wasn't a great student in high school. I was a failing student. And that was during the 1990s, during education reform, when a Republican governor, the first one in 20 years, was able to get a deal done with, with uh, education reform. And I was allowed to attend college for high school because not every sort of school is for every sort of student. And so school choice saved my future. We cannot trap children in failing schools. And the reality is the quality of your education is right now in Rhode Island determined by your zip code. That is a civil rights issue. So, uh, we so we uh, must uh, do briefly, that. Briefly, Mr. Case, the same, you, same amount of time, but she's full of us and not answering well, the you, question. Uh, you, were, you were over time at last check, which well, is why we've let her speak yeah. a bit more. I, I, I will answer it, which is which the talk about school choice. So some people execute school choice by moving to a different place with, uh, with an excellent public school system. Other people exercise school choice by sending their children to private schools. What I am saying is that if a child is trapped in a failing or unsuitable school in Rhode Island, that should not be determined, your ability to exercise school choice should not be determined by your income or which city or town you live in, whether or not they'll let you have it. Every child deserves to have a quality public education. That needs to be a constitutional right. So is that choice to you, vouchers? Is a choice to me vouchers? Would you like, oh, let's talk about school choice. Would you want, do you want to do that? <laughs> In 30 so, seconds, yeah. he brought it up. Yeah. Okay, so the way that we would do uh, school choice, and this has been done all over the country, is that we would start within the district and there would be transportation provided. Then we would move broader within the county, and then if there still isn't a suitable school, then you would move within the state. So if you're asking about money following the child, on an individual basis, that would be correct, but we would, we would not defund the school that is failing because what was done in Massachusetts and what is commonly done around the country is the school funding formula would be reformed to account for a failing school and there would be a special fund that would stabilize it. These are models that are all over the yeah. country. It, this it, is it, not there, there, uh, Mr. McKinley, let me ask you, because you, you, you've always been very outspoken about the need for more different types of school options, uh, such as public charters, uh, especially for students in the urban I'm just port. trying to get a clarification of this is a voucher program that she's talking about because she didn't answer the question about why she sends her kids to private schools. But uh, let's go over. I'd like to just say what we're doing for education it's right now. 30 seconds. So we're running very short at $300 million dollars for new school buildings, $50 million from the surplus we put in. Uh, we've got a $5,000 uh, goal on pre-kindergarten by 2028. Uh, we're, we're also creating eligibility for child rates for child care that uh, have not been raised in decades, and $180 million dollars into our higher ed alone uh, this year. So we are investing in education and also I made the Rhode Island Promise Permit. All right, I want to ask you both a quick question about politics. We're getting very close to the end of the show. Since you are the Republican and Democratic nominees, Mr. McKee, you were one of the first Rhode Island politicians to endorse Joe Biden for president back in 2019. We did do a poll earlier this year showing less than half of Democratic primary voters in Rhode Island want Biden to run for re-election again in 2024 when he'll be 82. Do you think President Biden should run us again or do you think he should step aside? President Biden's been the best president for the state of Rhode Island and that's what I do. my job is to make sure we take care of the state of Rhode Island. Island. I've been in his office. I also have been on, on, on the calls with him about women's rights. Certainly differ with, uh, with my opponent on that. Uh, and also on, on offshore wind. So yes, my answer would be yes. If he is feeling as though that he can run, uh, we should support him as our next president. All right, Ms. Kalis, you've said you accept the results of the 2020 presidential election. As you know, former President Trump has not. If Trump runs for president again in 2024, will you support him? You know, the questions about Trump are a distraction. They are, he's not running. And we but he, have, he might. He says he's considering running. We, but we're, I'm focused on this election and, and this president. We just spoke about President Biden. There was hope that President Biden would unify the country and said the country's more divided. There was hope that we would come out of the COVID crisis stronger as an economy. And instead, we have an economy that is not working well for everyone. So I would prefer to speak about the current president because that is what is impacting Rhode Island. But Those, are you open? Mr. McKee answered the question. Are you, <laughs> are you open to supporting President Trump if he decides to run again? 
I am not going to answer uh, hypotheticals about a race that may or may not happen. I would like to talk about the issues of Rhode Island, and I'm happy right, to speak. We're going to move on to well, the issues of Rhode Island. Actually, are, are, are an overflow from Trump's administration, especially as we talked at length on the Supreme Court. All right, let's. I, um, I, I mean, he doesn't. I don't think you understand economics. Actually, they're not an overflow. If you understand Keynesian economics, then what you would see is that. Infl are you talking about inflation? Because inflation was caused by putting too much money into the into the supply, which caused an inflationary crisis. So I we can talk about economics. I don't want the debate to go into Keynesian economics right, right now. I want I want to go to truck tolls, right. uh, Mr. Well, McKee. Well, talking points are talking points. And he can say that, but the reality is, I will sit down and have a real substantive policy conversation if he'd like to about and how. And, we and got I want to make sure you get to your closing statement. Yeah. I think that's important, Mr. McKee. As you know, a federal judge deemed Rhode Island's truck tolling policy unconstitutional. You're less than two weeks away from having to decide uh, whether or not you will appeal that decision. Can you tell us right now what you're planning to do? We'll, we'll appeal. You are going to appeal the truck toll decision. So you think the truck tolls were constitutional in the end? Yes, I think that uh, it's uh, we're going to we're going to appeal. Okay, we met with the Attorney General, the Senate President. Uh, you know, actually uh, governing uh, along with the Speaker, we'll be appealing. You know, uh, Ms. Kalos, it, it's easy to criticize what you have done the the Roadworks program, but when that program was announced, more than twenty five percent of the state's bridge decks were deemed structurally deficient. That has improved to seventeen percent. Right. Do you acknowledge that the programs work? I think that we should invest in public infrastructure. I've never been, I think public uh, money should go through to public goods. So my philosophy is yes, public money should go to public works projects, not to uh, a Superman building luxury apartment project, not to a soccer stadium for a private developer for a minor league soccer stadium that doesn't exist. I believe in investing in, um, in Rhode Island. I have no problem with that. The other thing with the tolls, if we if we can go back to that, is I would not appeal that decision. Uh, we know that the law was unconstitutional and bad law. So instead of not doing it, we went ahead and we spent eight million dollars on a politically connected law firm to fight that appeal, which we lost, and it is unconstitutional. So what the governor is saying in appealing is he's delaying the inevitability that he wants to tax uh, or toll all trucks and cars. I don't understand what the legal basis is. Well, do you understand the Commerce Clause? I mean, you, it is an unconstitutional law. Either you fix the law and tax all trucks and cars, which you won't commit to, or you don't appeal bad law. I mean, when you, you need to follow the law. So the obligation of the governor is to protect the Constitution and not to sign in bad law. And when that law was blatantly unconstitutional, I would have never signed it because I knew it was not legal. I would have known it wasn't legal. What is a legal justification for you appealing that? Uh, Mr. McKee. We'll appeal. And uh, let's talk about the infrastructure. You're right. We're down to 27 percent of our bridges. Uh, we'll be down to 10 percent, I mean 17 percent, now 10 percent. We're going to invest, because I manage the surplus, the largest surplus in the state, history of the state of Rhode Island, $100 million, freed up $400 million of federal dollars. We're doing $500 million of road, road work or fixing the potholes in the state of Rhode Island. We, are, we have $91 million of road work going on right now in the state of Rhode Island. Our plan, the plan that preceded me, I embrace plans that work. That is a plan that needs to continue. Infrastructure is an important part about our, uh, for our economy and for our livability in the state. So we have uh, one minute left before we get to closing statements. Um, so I just want to wrap with this. Look, people have been flooded with negative ads at home in this campaign, and it's undoubtedly going to get more tense over the next few weeks. So before we get to closing statements, I'm going to give you the opportunity to say something nice about your opponent, Mr. McKee. What do you have to say? We always say nice things about our family. Families are important. So Ashley's family is important, and it's a, that would be my nice thing to say. All right. And Ms. Kalis, something nice um, about your opponent? I think it's really cool that your daughter's on The Voice. We should all be cheering for her and very proud of her as well. To mention an NBC program on our air. I know. Believe it, Ms. Kalis, <laughs> but we do, wish, we do wish uh, <laughs> Karen. Well. All right. So uh, as I said, each candidate gets an opportunity for a one-minute closing remark, the order of which was drawn randomly prior to this debate. Up first is Mr. McKee. Mr. McKee, your 60-second closing statements. Well, thank you to Channel 12, and uh, thank you to the people who are listening out, out in the uh, audience. Uh, very important election. Uh, we just heard why. Uh, my opponent will not support a, the EACA. She'll b veto the budget. She's not gonna, she wouldn't support any new gun, gun, gun safety measures. 
and she has no governor's experience. I'm proud to be from Rhode Island. I'm proud to be in the United States. I wear my pin proudly, both of the United States and Rhode Island. I'm proud to support our veterans. I love this job. And the state is safer today than it was 20 months ago. Economically, it's stronger than it was 20 months ago. Our schools are now up and running. We want to keep this momentum going. So Ed, what I'm asking you to understand, this election is critical. We can either go with a Republican MAGA style uh, leader, or we can continue the direction that we have in the state of Rhode Island. Momentum like you've never seen before. I ask for your vote on November 8th. Thank you, Mr. McKee. And now, Ms. Kalis, your 60-second closing remarks. Tonight, you heard two very stark contrasts for the future of Rhode Island. Dan McKee represents the failed policies of the past. Corruption, insider deals, malaise, abuse of power, and incompetence. It is time to turn the page and look to the future. Mm -hmm. Yesterday is over. For a lot of families, every day gets harder. We're getting killed at the gas pump. Food prices are soaring. The, our electric and gas bills are through the roof. And the dream of home ownership is out of reach for many. Rhode Island must now choose a path. Do we continue with our constant excuses or do we fix our problems? Do we harp upon our failures or do we build upon our strengths? Do we continue old partisan fights or do we band together for all of Rhode Island? We have a once in a lifetime opportunity to change the course. If we have the political will, this will be a time of unparalleled success for Rhode Island, a moment of our unlimited potential. We are running a campaign of vision and substance, a competition of ideas and policies. This is the time right now to write the greatest chapter in Rhode Island's history. Thank the you, Ms. Kalis. And I want to thank both of the candidates for taking part in the 12 News debate. We appreciate your time for this hour-long commercial-free debate. And just coming up in a few minutes on WPRI.com, our post-debate digital show, where each of the campaigns will enter our spin room and complete debate coverage on WPRI.com and tonight on 12 News at 10 and 11, including in-depth analysis from our political expert, Joe Fleming. Then just one week from tonight, another debate live from the Providence Performing Arts Center, a debate between two candidates seeking to replace Congressman Jim Langevin, Democrat Seth Magaziner and Republican Alan Fung face off. The one hour debate airs live at 7 p.m. on 12 News and on WPRI.com. There, you can also sign up on uh, WPRI.com to attend that debate in person. Don't forget that early voting starts on October 19th, and I believe the last day to put in mail ballot applications is October 18th, if memory I, serves. Well, no uh, one fact checks the moderators like me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you all for watching this debate. If you missed any of it, we have it all on WPRI.com. And don't forget the post-debate digital show <laughs> with our spin room. We'll see you in one week from the, tonight on Channel 12, live from the Providence Performing Arts Center. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. Have a great evening.